Here is Sue Solomon, Senior Associate Director of 92Y Talks. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We're delighted you're here with us tonight for a very, very special event. 92Y and Scribs are pleased to present a very deeply personal conversation with Roxanne Gay and Soldad O'Brien. Scribd is a reading subscription service that provides access to ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, podcasts, and even more for $10 a month. Their Scribd Originals program features new original works by best selling authors, and they are proud again to be publishing tonight Roxanne Gay's essay, Writing Into the Wound Understanding Trauma, Truth, and Language. It's available exclusively on Scribd, and they are supporting this evening's program. Scrib is graciously offering everyone watching this evening a 60-day free access to Scrib by clicking on the link we have provided. There will also be an opportunity later on for audience questions. Time permitting, we'll get to as many as possible. Our moderator tonight is a multiple award-winning documentarian, journalist, and author who founded So Dad O'Brien Productions, a multi-platform media production company. The anchor and producer of Hearst TV political magazine, Matter of Fact, with Sodad O'Brien. She's also a correspondent for HBO's Real Sports. Joining her is one of the finest authors and cultural critics of her generation. A best-selling author, she's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and has just lost, just launched, forgive me, the Audacious Book Club and a newsletter, The Audacity. 92 Y and Scrib are pleased to present again for a deeply personal conversation, so that O'Brien and Roxanne Gay. Thank you, Sue. So uh, before we begin, I need to let everybody know that I'm just a big giant Roxanne Gay fan. So this is going to be literally one hour of me fangirling out on Roxanne Gay, who I think is brilliant and funny and just amazing. Uh, I got to know Roxanne through Twitter, I think, because um, I mean, and when you think writers, you don't think writers of interesting and funny tweets, but that's really how I got to know Roxanne. And so I guess I'll start there, Roxanne, which is um, talk to me a little bit about your writing, but on social media, because you're funny, you're witty, you're sassy, you have a nemesis, which I think is amazing. And you're, <laughs> uh, and, and there's so many things that I got to know about you as like a human being uh, just through Twitter, which is pretty unusual. So let's start there and then we'll get into writing in the macro. Sure. Well, I'm a fan of yours as well. But, um, so thank you for doing this, Solida. Um, I've been on Twitter for many years now. I think I've been on Twitter since 2007. And I first joined Twitter because I was in graduate school and I was living in Hancock, Michigan. And it is a town of 4,000 people, 4,000 white people. And uh, so I wanted to feel connected to the writing community and the world. And I felt like maybe this might be a big cool thing to try. And I also really enjoyed the constraint of 140 characters. So early on, it was just like this idea that I could be at a cocktail party, but in my pajamas. Mm -hmm. And I could, you know, I had to really start to think about the economy of language. And that was really exciting because, you know, you had to frame things, oh, the door's ringing. You have to frame things as, um, you know, as efficiently as you can. And so that really got me into thinking about language and how can I sort of offer a response to whatever in the most efficient way. And, uh, over the years, my following has grown and that's been interesting and strange and unexpected, but I, I just enjoy it. And in many ways, I still think that I have like 200 followers <laughs> and, and I forget. And then there are these very clear reminders that I have far more than 200 followers. Uh, so it's an adjustment because when you have a few number of followers, you can kind of say whatever you want and it's really low stakes. But now it seems like no matter what I say, there's going to be someone who objects to it and I'm learning to not care. And that's really hard for me because like most people, you know, I want to be liked. And so I struggle with not caring. 
Um, and so it's, it's a balancing act. Being a writer seems like a bad career choice if you want to be liked. <laughs> I mean, talk a terrible career choice. I, I did not plan this well, but I also never thought that writing was going to be a career. I always took myself seriously as a writer and I always wanted to be a writer, but I never for one second thought that I would be able to make a living as a writer. And I think that's a healthy way to go about it because it takes many, many years to get to that place and very few writers do. And even the writers who do generally have day jobs in academia teaching for health insurance and things like that. So um, it is one of those things where I am very surprised every single day that this is my life, but it's also really challenging because I have thoughts and opinions and I love sharing them. <laughs> and people have feedback. <laughs> and I, I, I have no problem with critical engagement. I think it's healthy, I think it's great, but there's a difference between critical engagement and the sort of unfiltered thoughts of hundreds of thousands of people who each want something different from my writing while I can only give what I intend to give through the work. So that too is a balancing act. And only half of them have actually accurately read what you wrote in the first one. <laughs> I can't tell you the number of people who respond to my work and I can tell they have not read it. They have not even clicked on the <laughs> link. They are reading either the comments below the link or they're reading the um, subject or the, the title of the piece. And they may have just, they know what the subject is and they just have thoughts about immigration. And so they respond to that really broadly, but then they frame it in the context of me. It's wild. It is so wild. Never has there been a medium where so many people read so little but have so much to say. <laughs> and my favorite piece of Twitter, and then we'll move on, is the, well, if you're writing about this, you must hate this over here. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you uh, love strawberries? Well, what the fuck is wrong with oranges? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you hate oranges. Yeah. You know, I'm gathering some people who love oranges, and we're boycotting you because you Absolutely. hate oranges. Obviously, <laughs> There is very little room for nuance. And, yes. and that's particularly challenging for me because one of the things that I strive for in my writing is nuance and to acknowledge that there are multiple points of view about pretty much everything and that most of those points of view have merit, even if I disagree with them. And then you come to a medium like Twitter and it's a sledgehammer. There's no grace or elegance about it. And to try and have productive, nuanced conversations on Twitter is quite frankly, nearly impossible. And, and then I no longer try. Uh, because, you know, when people are like, I come here for the debate, well, I don't. I come here to talk about yogurt and, <laughs> you know, like pictures other, of dogs. <laughs> and, you know, like to share, to talk about Meghan Markle, like, which, bless her heart, I hope that man is worth it. <sighs> and, you know, things like that. Because I just, you know, like my job is to go in depth in my writing. And so that's the debate for me. I, I don't have the energy to then carry on that debate with every single person who feels like they want to share their thoughts with me. I respect that, by the way, but I just, you know, only have 24 hours in my day. When did you realize that you would be a writer, uh, that it would be your profession, it would be what you do, what you're known for, and that you could make a living out of it? Um, <laughs> last year. <laughs> <laughs> last year was the first year I did not have a day job. Really? Yeah. I kept my day job all the way through because of health insurance mostly. And then I got to join the Writers Guild. And so now I, well, I have, then I got health insurance through that. And then I got married. So now I don't have to worry about it because my wife has a job. Um, so it was really last year. And I still wonder if I've made the right decision. And I still entertain offers from universities because there's something very, um, appealing about having an institutional home and that sort of safety net of a day job, which I highly, highly encourage every writer to have. Um, because writing is fickle. Like, you know, I might be having a good year this year, but I don't know what's going to happen next year or the year after that. 
it's not one of those things in general, unless you're one of the very famous writers who can steadily count on everything they do being successful. When you're writing, are you solving for something? Are you thinking of the audience? Walk us through the process a little bit. I mean, the only thing I really hear about writing and I, I knock out op-eds, I'll do articles, short essays, but I, I'm not a writer. I'm a TV writer, which is really not a writer. But I always wonder how your process is around, I think of an idea, it's like, um, it's almost like uh, composers. I always wonder, like you start with the piano or is it you hear a, you know something else, the harmony in your head and then you kind of build around it. How do you think about it? It depends, but in general, I am trying to find the answers to a question through my writing. I don't even necessarily know the answer, but my work is showing the math of how I get to the response to the answer. And it, it's very inquiry based and a lot of the work is exploring the different alternatives and the different options and the different opinions out there and then coming to a conclusion. And I don't even always get to a conclusion. Sometimes it's ambiguous and uh, there is no definitive answer, but that's interesting as well. So a lot of it is just trying to answer questions. Um, and I really enjoy that. Um, that process of inquiry, but showing the inquiry instead of simply saying, here are my conclusions without showing the math. You write a lot about trauma and you write a lot about yourself. Do you, it would make me think that maybe you're the kind of person who likes to talk about herself and likes people to know a lot about yourself. But most writers I know are actually almost sometimes painfully shy and, and actually don't want to share anything. And again, it's this weird contradiction, like, oh my gosh, then why are you writing about this thing that's so personal? Sue, when she introduced us, said it's going to be a deeply personal conversation. Um, and so I, I'm curious, yeah, exactly. And we're, and we're delivering that for Sue. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if you, if you feel like um, you, you have to open yourself up and, and, and give yourself to, the, to a, a world that you hope, once you send that, you know, something off to be published, understands it, gets it, cares, loves you in spite of it, loves you for it? Mm. Well, I'm actually very shy and I am very private. I never really thought I would ever write about myself for a number of reasons. One, I did not think I was that interesting. And I also was afraid of my people in my personal life knowing too much about me, which I know sounds strange, but um, I had not told my parents what had happened to me and when I was 12. And so I just always thought, okay, I'm gonna write, but I'm gonna write about other people and other things. And then I found that sometimes things from my personal life are relevant to whatever it is I'm writing about. And, and there's nothing wrong with um, sharing that. And so I just have firm boundaries over what I will and will not share. And I try to be judicious about what I share from my life and to make sure that there is a relevance to it. Um, and that it's not just, here's everything about me. Uh, because you have to always, I think, at, at least for me, I have to hold certain things just for me, for my friends, for my family. Um, if you give too much of yourself, then you are not left with very much. So when you're writing about trauma, are you trying to, I mean, let's take, for example, um, what you write about in your script essay, which is amazing, and everybody who can click on that link, which I think they threw into the chat, it's really, really worth it, and you should do it immediately and, and get the trial. And the, the essay is, it's so moving, and it's hard to read, and it's beautiful, and it's, it's such an interesting way of like thinking about how people think about trauma. So I want you to talk to me a little bit about what happened when you published a book that got rave reviews. But the, 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 the aftermath of the, uh, that's not even the aftermath, that's not the right word, the during of it was so weird. And I remember watching it unfold because I'd see some of these interviews and, and the whole thing just kind of went sideways. Uh, the book was wildly successful and yet you had opened this thing that went a weird way. So explain that for our audience. And then I wanna talk about talking about trauma and even risking re-traumatizing yourself when you talk about trauma? Sure, when I 
published Hunger, I knew that there would be some challenging media because people really are ill-equipped to talk about fatness. And people tend to be really awkward about it because they're uncomfortable with fatness. And so I thought I was prepared, but then journalists really outdid themselves to be terrible in asking not only intrusive questions, which I expected and which comes with the territory when you write a memoir, but simply offensive questions, ignorant questions, questions that demonstrated that either they only read the first few chapters of the book or they did not understand what they read. And that was incredibly disappointing. It was incredibly painful to have spent so much energy and put so much of myself into this book. Um, it was just really painful. I mean, there's no easy way to say it. And, you know, like when people that you previously looked up to absolutely disappoint you in the ways that, you know, so I did a fresh air interview and I was really excited and my father was excited um, because he loves fresh air and Terry Gross was clearly uncomfortable and did not know how to handle, like she was personally just shocked by fatness and the realities of my life and did not know how to move beyond that shock in her conversation with me. And so at the end of that interview, I actually thought, oh, there's no way they're gonna air this because it was such a disaster, but they have really good editors because they managed to put together a coherent interview. But at one point during the conversation, she said, so describe your body to me. And I was like, girl, what? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> so I said, I'm tall. And she said, well, what else would you say about your body? And I said, well, I'm very tall because I didn't want to give her what she wanted. I think she assumed that I would respond with uh, a lot of self-loathing and, you know, I'm a person, I have dignity and I am not merely my body. And for her to not be able to grapple with that and see me as a human being was one of the more surprising and frustrating experiences that I've had with the media. It, it was just a lot, but thankfully I'm, I have, if I finish it this week, I have a new book coming out in uh, November and I'm really excited because it's not about me and I get to um, talk about something other than hunger, which I love. I'm proud of hunger. It's a, you know, I think it's a good enough book, but um, I've said everything I need to say about it at this point. You, do you write about trauma to process it? Do you write about trauma to inform people? You know, you know how I think about trauma? I'm like, I am going to repress it. That is my strategy. Like, I feel like that's a very solid, not going to talk about it, do my best to shove it down there and never, ever discuss it. And and I always am so amazed when people uh, talk about trauma. And, and also I think the ways you talk about trauma and what Terry Gross did and others do all the time, right? I think TV journalists do this a lot. I, I want the exact words, give me the exact thing, what happened, they live through this. And, and I think a lot of your writing often doesn't go for the jugular on that. And I, I, I like it because I think it, it kind of leaves it up to the viewer or the reader in a way. I, I watched a documentary, I think I've told you this once, where the women, the young girls really had been sexually trafficked. And, yes. and I remember the documentarian was like, I'm actually not gonna have them talk about it. Mm -hmm. She's like, I just, the, and, and, and she said, there was so much pushback for people like, I need, I, I need to hear this little girl giving every brutal, disgusting detail of this thing. She's like, nope. Actually, I, I we're gonna and and it was so effective, right? This it was genius, and it actually was more powerful, I think. Um, so, talk to me a little bit about, you know, are you tired of talking about trauma? Do you like talking about trauma? You obviously can give a lot of advice on how people think about trauma. Yeah, I don't like it. No, I wish that the world was far less traumatized than it is. I I, I definitely don't intend to process trauma when I write about it. I hopefully am in a place where I have already processed it well, as much as one can before I sit down to write about it. Um, that, because I think the processing is something that should happen if you're lucky enough to in therapy. Uh, even though that said, 
writing can be really therapeutic for a lot of people and it certainly has been therapeutic for me. A hunger ended up being a lot more cathartic than I ever intended it for it to be because in the writing of the book, it forced me to look at a lot of the behaviors I had been engaging in for um, more than 20 years. And so then I had to ask myself, are these behaviors serving me or am I really just, you know, my own worst enemy? Am I really hampering myself in ways that are not useful anymore because I'm an adult and I have, I have better tools now to cope with trauma? And that put me in a position to make some decisions that I would have never made had I not written the book. And so I was really grateful for that. And it ended up just being a pleasant side effect. And, you know, the thing is, I think that however people come to writing about trauma, it's fine. You just have to make sure that you're protecting yourself. And that's why when you told me that story about the filmmaker who chose not to have the young women sharing their stories, um, that meant a lot to me because, you know, people tend to think you have to detail every horror of a trauma and you don't, in fact, <laughs> in one of the reviews of Bad Feminist, I had written an essay in Bad Feminist called um, What We Hunger For. And that was and ultimately the inspiration for hunger. And I wrote about my assault, but I didn't go into any detail about it because, you know, I just thought, do the details actually matter or does just saying what happened matter? And I felt like just saying what happened was what mattered most. And um, one of the reviewers, and this review has been talked about in the media a lot lately because the author has a novel out right now. She said that, well, A, she hates my writing. And B, <laughs> Sorry. seven years later, that shit is fresh as a daisy. Um, she really, she threw the book across the room when I said that I was not gonna go into detail about my assault. And I was like, wow, wow. That that's reveals a lot about you, lady. Yeah, and you know, that's the thing. <laughs> Ultimately, I concluded, like, that's a reflection on you, not on me. And, you know, it's a choice that not everyone is going to understand. But sometimes it's enough to say, this thing happened to me. Our imaginations, quite frankly, are going to fill in the blanks and not even nearly as bad as that trauma was. And so, you know, in writing this essay, um, I wanted to just make sure that we could create a space in writing about trauma that would accommodate all of the different ways of going about it, that there's not one prescriptive way to do it. And I think that's really healthy because what works for me as a writer and frankly, as a reader is not necessarily what's gonna work for someone else. And that's okay. I think there's room at the table, so to speak, for a lot of different ways of approaching this subject. You write in your scribbed essay, which by the way, I like to call scribe just because, because um, it looks like scribe to me, but it's scribbed. Um, your essay that uh, about teaching this class mm -hmm. and it sounded so interesting and it sounded so life-giving. Like sometimes people describe teaching young, youngish people that, you know, as a drag or exhausting or, but, but it just seemed like even the process of getting to select who would come into your class was was fascinating. The topic was writing about trauma. And you were very picky. Uh, I mean, obviously you couldn't take that many students, but, but you said no practitioners can come in. So yeah. tell me why you made that cut. And then what kind of a class did you assemble? How did it turn out? So uh, last year I got to um, return to Yale where I had gone as an undergrad to teach, which imagine my surprise. And I, I went back as, um, a visiting associate professor for one year, for one semester. Um, they have this fellowship where they bring in people every year. And I was really thrilled and it was really quite an honor. And when they asked me what I wanted to do, I said, you know, I think I would love to teach a writing workshop on writing trauma because so many people are trying to do it. And I think a lot of people are looking for guidance. Like, how do I do this? And not only how do I do it, but how do I do it well? And how do I do it ethically? And so they told me that there was going to be a lot of demand for the class, which I thought was wild. And I was like, you're, I think you're overestimating. Literally me. people in the chat are like, I wish I'd gone to the class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so um, I had to open, I had to create a little application process. And many, not any, I would say maybe 10 or 15 of the people who applied were practitioners who wanted to figure out how they could help their patients 
uh, therapists, mental health practitioners, how they could help their patients process their trauma through writing, which I think is wonderful. But that's not what my class was about because I'm actually not a mental health professional. And it's so important to, to understand that distinction so that you don't do damage. Um, and so I was just looking for students who had just interesting reasons for wanting to take the class, who had interesting backgrounds. They did not need to have writing experience. Uh, one of the students had never written before, um, creative writing. And uh, he was really phenomenal. And um, I've actually gone on to publish two of the students, three of the students in the class. Um, they were just so good. And so it just put together this really wonderful mix of students. And one of the key questions I ask is, um, what is a book on trauma that you really admire or your favorite book on writing trauma? And I think I put like a little parenthetical about, I mean, as favorite as something like this can be. And, you know, a lot of people put books you might expect, like I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, which is a lovely, lovely book, but there's so much more out there. And so I was looking for people who had read beyond that. And mm. those were many of the students who ended up in the class. And I also believe in inclusion and sometimes you have to be deliberate about it. So I wanted to make sure there was a good gender balance. I wanted to make sure that, that there was a, a good, you know, like I, that students of color were prioritized. And so it ended up being um, 14 students of color and uh, no, 13 students of color and three white students. And I think that's very healthy. Um, so, how do you create a space? I hate the word safe space and maybe other yeah. people love it. I find it really just, I'm not even sure what it means, but how do you create with that many students, a place where people can talk about something that's so personal as trauma, um, but also, hey, it's a class, they need to get something out of it. And, and you're going into it, trying to give them very specific lessons, which mm -hmm. by the way, none of us, and there's now like 20 people who've sent me a note that they wish they were in the class. Uh, so maybe you can give us some of the takeaways of how do you think about writing about trauma as well? Yeah, for sure. You know, I, one of the things that I told my students early on in the semester is that I cannot guarantee your safety. And you need to understand that. But if there's anything that makes you feel unsafe and if there's anything you anticipate making you feel unsafe as you look at the readings, because for once I did my whole syllabus up front. <laughs> I knew what I was gonna do. I had the entire thing um, so that they would know what was coming up. I wanted them to be really prepared and I don't use trigger warnings in my classes, but I do believe in preparation. So my students are always gonna know what's coming and what to expect from a reading. So I just told them that and one student did want an accommodation and I was more than happy to provide it for them. And so we just proceeded like that. And I also tried to cultivate a, an environment of inclusion and, and mutual respect. And so when we workshopped, we were gonna listen to each other and we were not going to judge each other's choices as they were conveyed through their writing. And we were going to be critical of each other, but in constructive ways. And um, we were going to hold space for each other if things got difficult. And it ended up working out. I mean, these students were phenomenal. I just cannot say enough about these kids. And people always ask me, do I prefer teaching undergrad or grad? And I'll tell you what, I choose undergrads every time. They are the best. They're so smart and they're so energetic. And they, they, they're willing to learn and they're willing to take risks. They have a little cockiness about them that I like, you know what, I respect that young blood. <laughs> so, um, it ended up being a great experience. And you know, the key things that we talked about are what are the most effective ways to write about trauma without traumatizing yourself or, or re-traumatizing yourself or the reader? How do we write about the trauma of others without co-opting their stories and cannibalizing their stories? How do we not cannibalize ourselves? How do we proceed in writing about trauma and recognizing that trauma is not the only thing that we have to offer the world? Uh, because a lot of times anyone who's marginalized, people expect us to only write about trauma when we have all kinds of things that we can write about. Uh, one woman wrote about environmental trauma, which I had never even thought about. 
And she's right. We are actually dealing with a lot of environmental crises. And there is a real trauma in knowing that if we do not change our behaviors, this planet <laughs> is not long for this war universe. Um, so it was just great to watch them grappling with these questions and introducing new questions. And um, it was a really a memorable class. And I, I must say those students worked their asses off. Uh, you know, normally when you're working with undergrads, with all students, you assign a lot of homework and not everyone's gonna do the homework. These kids did every reading I, and I assign more reading than you can do. And they were like, yep, on page 371, <laughs> the 10th reading of the day. And I was just like, listen, nerds, you need to go fucking party and <laughs> stop doing your homework and just be, you know, be 21, man. <laughs> but uh, I, I really appreciated the, uh, the respect that they offered one another and the class and me, it was great. What was on your reading list off the top of your head? And, so and give us a couple of things. If you're gonna write about trauma, maybe not obviously the entire semester in three seconds, but give me a couple of, of, of pointers because I get a lot of questions. I see it in the chat of people kind of trying to figure it out, but start with the syllabus. Yes, the, um, the books we read are in the essay, Writing into the Wound, so check it out. No, and just click on that link and you, you will be getting so script read, for 60 um, days. Possessing the Secret of Joy by Alice Walker. Disgrace by J.M. Uh, J. Kutze. Um, the Chronology of Water by Lydia Yuknovich. Uh, Bastard Out of Carolina by Dorothy Allison. I've got the list here, I can help. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think one other. Oh okay. yes, uh, Heartberries by um, Therese Mayo and um, Heavy, Heavy by Kiese Lehman. Thank you. It was a okay. really great reading, <laughs> if I do say so myself. I was very pleased. And in addition to that, every week I had supplementary readings because some weeks I used um, a thematic approach like writing about sexual assault writing about medical trauma, writing about um, ways of coping with trauma, using humor to write about trauma. And I assembled various essays. And so I made a digital reader with PDFs of everything because I wanted the students to be able to take this and then you know go forth into the world with a set of readings in case they needed to refer back to something. In terms of some tips, you know, I think the key thing when writing about trauma is to have a sense of purpose about it. One of the things that young writers often tell me, um, both in the classroom and elsewhere, is that they have a story to tell. And that's why they want to write. And the thing is, that's wonderful. But it has to be more than that. Like everyone has a story to tell. Just because you experience trauma does not make it inherently interesting. And so I think it's really important for people to have a clear sense of purpose that goes beyond this thing happened to me. Otherwise you're writing for yourself, which is fine, but you're not also considering what it means to write for an audience. Um, I think it's important to think about how you write about trauma because some people choose to be explicit and to be very detailed and open about what happened and some people write around it. And there are great reasons for both, but you need to be clear on what you want the reader to take away from your piece and which strategy being explicit or not is gonna help you best achieve that. And so throughout the semester, we talked about things like that. And we talked about, um, we analyzed the readings because each of them approached trauma in different ways, uh, you know, whether it's through fiction and nonfiction and we read a mix of both. Um, and we got a lot out of it. It was really a worthwhile endeavor. I would ask one last question then I'm gonna open it up to those 10 million audience questions I'm getting. <laughs> um, uh, and someone said uh, they would like to have the list uh, that we just read. This is being taped, so you'll have an opportunity to either listen to it, but also maybe we can throw it up and post it. And it's also in the script link as well. And then someone is saying do Roxanne's masterclass, which is also a really good uh, recommendation. Um, I feel like we're in a moment now of collective trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when the George Floyd video came out 
And I spent a lot of time on Twitter. And I remember looking at it and thinking like, I'm not sure I can retweet this. Like I, I literally feel like I am going to, it's so upsetting to me. And I've seen a lot of bad stuff in my 25 years <laughs> uh, that, that it's so upsetting that I don't know, like I, I worry that if I send this out, which I think is important, I think people need to understand it. I think people need to see it. And I, I know I'm literally about to really screw some people's heads with this. And I, I always kind of struggle with that. But I feel like we have over the last few years and maybe longer than that, just collectively been very traumatized by, uh, especially for people who are marginalized, right? Especially people of color. It's just, I, I don't, how do you think about that? And how do you think about how we process that? I'm, I think of myself as a very stoic person. Like, I don't think I've ever used the word trauma until about three years ago. And I was like, wow, watching these terrible things happen over and over and over again is, is very upsetting and traumatizing. Yes, uh, at the end of the essay, I write about the collective trauma that we've definitely endured, at least most of us, since, um, Donald Trump was elected. And, you know, we've also dealt with collective trauma as well before that. Uh, the, tr the trauma of enslavement, the trauma of poverty for, pe for people who've experienced it, the trauma of migration, which even when you do it voluntarily can be incredibly traumatic. Um, you know, how do we cope with that? How do we process that? How do we acknowledge the ways in which that is shaping how we see the world and how we move through the world? And I think these are questions that we don't yet have answers for. I certainly don't, but I do know that you have to at least acknowledge. And I think in the coming years, because we haven't even begun to process what's going on with the pandemic, I think that we're gonna start to really lay out what happened here, not only in terms of this disease and the ways it disproportionately affected communities of color, but the absolute malfeasance of the government to do anything about it for what, an eight months, nine months? Um, you know, how do you recover from that? How do you recover from literally a year away from other humans at, for if you're lucky? And so, when I'm thinking about collective trauma, I'm thinking not only about like, how do I write about it, but how are people gonna process what I'm writing? And how do I acknowledge where they might be in terms of their understanding of the trauma um, and where they might wanna get to? And, you know, it's just a lot. And I think we're still, we're just beginning quite frankly to wrap our minds over what happened with Donald Trump and what might still happen because I mean, it's not like he has disappeared he just has been quieted, but he's still fake wealthy and he's still powerful and he's still evil. And that's a really deadly combination. And so there is a lot of trauma looming if he happens to run for office again and you know, find ways to be dastardly. Someone said, I think it was uh, Adam Serwer wrote, you know, the cruelty is the point. And it made me feel badly about my neighbors, right? Like you think you're all in the same boat together and you have disagreements and whatever, but for the most part, like you're cheering for team America. And it was one of the few times that I was like, wow, I, whew, it's a, you're right. And, and seeing all those people who said goodbye to their loved ones over a, an iPad, yes. I don't think I can get like the horror of that out of my, it's my head. Too much. It's just too much. And I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. And so I grew up around a lot of Republicans and I grew up with this idea that there were these, we may disagree politically, but we still respect each other as humans. Like Nebraskans in particular are very invested in this idea of the good conservative. And, you know, it's easy to buy into that myth until that myth starts to harm you. And when we saw 72 million people vote for Donald Trump this year after everything he did, or I, in November 2020, after everything he did, you know, I think that if you hadn't already come to realize that there really is a stark divide, you realized it then that, you know, not all of our neighbors believe that we are um, human. Not all of our neighbors believe that we deserve rights and dignity and safety and 
a minimum wage. And you know, even now we're seeing that when Congress is continuing to debate $15 as a minimum wage, and that's not even enough for a living wage. That's just the start. The minimum wage should be around $22. And we're nowhere near that. It will be probably not in our lifetimes that we get to $22. It's still at $7.25. And and so like when we have such rank indifference for our fellow humans, it, it's hard to be able to look some of our neighbors in the eye and be like, well, we're all human and in this together because we actually aren't. Alex has a question, question for Roxanne. What are her thoughts on fiction, <laughs> fictionalizing personal trauma? Is it cowardly or can it be effective? Oh, it's absolutely not cowardly. And yes, it can be effective. Dorothy Allison's Bastard Out of Carolina is uh, a fictionalization that bears some resemblance to her life, but is fictionalized. And I think it's a really healthy way of approaching trauma. Sometimes you need that distance. Sometimes you don't want to disclose your own life, but you want to tell the, the sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The broad strokes of your story. And fiction gives you a vehicle for doing that. And fiction is a really great way of engendering empathy in the audience. So I think it's a great strategy and I've certainly done it. I know most writers have used fiction at one point or another because you know, there are a lot of reasons. From Emma, did editing Not That Bad help you develop an identity, identify, what is my problem with reading today? Identify <laughs> the course at Yale. Um, that's a good question. Yes, it did in that, actually it was, it was in many ways the impetus for the course because I received I, around 330 submissions for Not That Bad. In addition to the work I solicited, I took work from a submission queue. And I would say of those 330 pieces, 300 of them were testimony. Were just people saying this terrible thing happened to me and here are the details. And it was all genuine. It was all heartfelt. Like these people were really sincere about wanting to share their stories, but that's not an essay. That's the disclosure and there's a difference. And so I thought, how can I reach writers to let them know that that first outpouring of this is what happened to me is not something that necessarily is going to work for an audience. And then I took it from there. From Joan, please speak some more about the use and misuse of trigger warnings in training slash classes. Sometimes they seem like disrespectful ways of protecting the teacher slash facilitator from the reality of people's lives. People can and do survive. Yeah, I'm, I, I wrote an essay um, in Bad Feminist called the, the Illusion of Safety, the Safety of Illusion. And I don't believe in trigger warnings, <coughs> but just because I don't believe them doesn't mean they don't matter because trigger warnings are not for me then, they are for um, people who need them. That said, I just think it's impossible to be able to anticipate what's going to trigger someone. And I think that we all have to be responsible for ourselves. And I don't mean that in a cavalier way. I mean that we have to be able to, 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 to say, okay, this thing triggers me, I, I need this accommodation or I need to step away or, or however you need to deal with it. But when, I, when you put a trigger warning on, on a, a piece of writing or a, to a lesser extent, a piece of you know, film or television, you're warning people about what they should think about the content before they've even had a chance to experience it. And you're also saying that some subjects are not palatable. Like I've seen trigger warnings for racism <coughs> and it's like, Tamir Rice didn't get a trigger warning for racism. So are we seriously gonna put a trigger warning for racism? I mean, who's that for? Is it for people of color? I don't think so. I think it's for white people. And, and so I just question that. And I, I know that's maybe not a popular opinion, but I just am not gonna do it. And, but that said, I don't judge you if you prefer trigger warnings. I think that's an entirely reasonable thing to want as well. So I'm a Libra. I'm always going to see both sides of it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I was having a conversation uh, with a young trans man, and I was saying that I had been in some place where they had a 
uh, all gender bathroom, but they only had one bathroom in the entire place. And so I was sort of laughing like, come on, all to you know, my bathrooms at home are also all gender because like, and he said, uh, it wasn't, it's not for you. Like, do you understand that this symbol is not speaking to you? It's to signal to somebody else, we want you here, we respect you here, this is a place for you. And it was so, I mean, I literally was sort of mocking this kind of you know ridiculous thing when you have one bathroom and it really made me rethink like, oh yeah, the signage that's really not about you and not for you and you can ignore and other people get a lot out of it. Um, uh, there was a question about how your life has changed since you got married. So insurance, obviously, <laughs> one thing. Insurance. but I think they meant bigger than that. Yeah, no, um, marriage has surprised me in that my wife and I, you know, we had a great relationship before we got married. Our wedding was actually supposed to be on October 10th, 2020. And then it was supposed to be on October 11th, 2021, but it's a 400 to 450 person wedding. So there was just no way to have it safely. And so right now it's all up in the air. Um, so we eloped on June 6th, 2020. And the moment we got married and signed our marriage license, it just, there was a sense of gravity that I had not felt before. And we were already committed to one another, but it just added some gravitas to the relationship and the sense that we are now responsible for each other forever, if we're lucky. And it's been great. And it's also, you know, it's nice. Before COVID, we both traveled extensively. And so we saw each other at least twice a month. But since COVID, we've been together every single day. <laughs> and it's been awesome. We, like, we really get along. In fact, um, we're going to spend three days apart toward the end of the month because she's going to head back to New York before me so I can have some days to write. And like, we're already kind of sad about it. Like, oh, man. And so um, marriage has been great. And it's been great to have someone who just has my back. Uh, even on the bad days, it's just great. Like if something shitty happens, she's there to listen and provide perspective that I might be too emotional to have. And she's for better and worse, she's, she's like tells the truth. She's not a coddler. And so that's great to have someone who's like willing to, to hold you accountable. Like when you're being self-pitying or, you know, like whatever uh, it's yeah. So marriage so far, I would give it a 10 out of 10. <laughs> uh, this is from Sandrine. It's a little long, but it's a really interesting question. How do you manage the end when you have written about your personal trauma and manage the aftermath and then joy or peace appears? How do you manage that? I'm at that stage and I feel that writing into the wound opened the access to joy. And I literally have no idea how to write within joy. Have you experienced that in the aftermath of hunger? Have you dealt with this? As an African woman, I'm honestly at loss about the joy of writing into the wound. Like, am I allowed to write about my joy after having centered a lot of my writing and my identity around the genocide I survived and other trauma? Sandrine, that's a great question. And it's one that I'm grappling with as well. Uh, someone recently asked me, are you happy? And my go-to instinct is to say, of course not. <laughs> and, and I had to pause because I just thought, no, that's not true actually, y yes. I am happy. And, and then I try to always qualify it, but like, but this thing is still terrible and this thing is still terrible. And it's just like, wait, yeah, that's true, but I'm also happy. And it's really uncomfortable. I do not know what to do with it. And so I am trying to figure that out. And I've been thinking about happiness and joy and writing for a while because in creative writing workshops in particular, you don't see a lot of happy stories. And frankly, in literature, you don't. In um, Best American Short Stories several years ago, the, um, uh, what's her name? Gertrude, Gertrude, uh, anyway, a writer, well-known, wrote that what happened to the joy in American fiction? Why don't we see any? And I've never forgotten that. And I don't think we know how to write about happiness and joy too much because I think a lot of times people think it's boring and that the only thing that's interesting is is anger unhappiness and suffering and so my challenge to myself over the next stroke several years is to figure out how do I write about joy in ways that are going to be tangible and meaningful and interesting for an audience 
and for myself. And so I will report back, Sandrine. So I'm <laughs> glad that you've gotten to a place of happiness as well. Christina writes this, and I'm going to glom another question onto it. The reaction to your writing is often not nuanced or kind in creating such vulnerable pieces of yourself with us as readers. How do you protect your core? And my add on to that, which I meant to ask earlier, was why are people so, why can't they handle discussions about fatness? Like, what is it? It, 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 I, you're right. And I followed so much of that media and it was bizarre, like off the rails sometimes. Yeah. And really what, why? So those two questions together, the reaction and then why in that case, that reaction. Yeah. The reactions to my work tend to be disproportionate to what <laughs> I say. I think that there's a lot of resentment and I'm not I know where some of it comes from and I don't know where most of it comes from. And I can't do much about it. So I just try to be myself and continue to write the kinds of things I wanna write. And it's boundaries that allow me to be able to handle it because I only put stuff into the world that I'm comfortable like with people discussing and doing whatever with. And, and you know, not every day is easy, but it is, you know, like something I can generally handle. And I just try to take it with a grain of salt. Like when I've written the book or the essay or the short story or whatever, my work is actually done. I don't have to engage with my critics. That's not for me. Criticism is actually not for the writer. Criticism is for other readers. And I always try to give myself that perspective after I you know, sit in my feelings about reviews and stuff. I will say, with maybe two exceptions, reviews of my work have, whether they were um, positive or negative, not negative, that's not a fair word, critical, they've actually been really good. And I appreciate the critical engagement with my work, even if I don't agree with the reviews. Most people have, in, in the professional realm, have done a really wonderful job engaging with my work. And the critiques are always, after I've had time to cry about it, really fair. So. That's fine. It's the sort of secondary market of criticism that really is a horrible place. And so I actually try not to read it. I don't need to know what like Joe 2121 thinks about my work. Like, it's just, it's fine. Like, it's, it's not for me. That's for him. It's for him to like sort of stunt around to his little friends, whatever. Uh, in terms of fatness, people are really just uncomfortable about fatness. They, Why? because they don't want to be fat because they know how they treat fat people. Mm -hmm. It's all grounded in like, it, this is one of those phobias that's truly grounded in fear. And uh, this country has done a real, the world in fact, but especially the United States has done a really good job in pathologizing fatness and making it seem like fat people are the thing that is a drain on the medical system. When in fact, the lack of health insurance for everyone is the drain on the health system. You know, everyone lives in a body. And uh, Sonia Renee Taylor wrote a book called The Body Is Not an Apology. And it's an incredible book. And one of the things she writes about in the book is that we actually don't owe anyone good health. You know, like people, because people are always like fatness is unhealthy. First of all, no. But second of all, so what if it is? Like there's nothing in the social contract that says we owe one another perfect health. And very few people are perfectly healthy. And my favorite is when smokers want to fucking sit around and talk about fatness being unhealthy really. Uh, <laughs> and so it's just one of those things. And because people in general deride fatness, they think that fat phobia is okay and culturally acceptable. And there's all kinds of reinforcement from popular culture where fat people are humiliated time and time again, um, to the news where you see this phenomenon of the headless fat person where they do stories on fat people and it's just this mass of fat people walking without heads. And so they're these disembodied and therefore inhuman creatures that don't deserve any fairness or dignity to you know the medical establishment that is very reluctant to treat fat people. And um, there are many gynecologists who will not treat fat people. And so you know then fat people develop illnesses that maybe weren't even at all related 
to their fatness, but that become compounded over time because doctors refuse to give them adequate health care. So then it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And very few people are willing to actually sit and just consider what it all means. And then the media, journalism is broken and we know this. And that's like our whole next hour yeah. on nine two Y. It's so broken. broken. And so I it, hate saying it. It breaks my heart to say it, but care. it's so it's like, it shouldn't be this way, but like it's, I, I, and the thing is we don't really know how to fix it so that people can make a living and, and tell the truth and tell these important stories. And so right now we have a model where you have to generally write toward the lowest common denominator and to write toward the thing that will get the most clicks and views and, and the most- Hashtag Dr. Seuss people. canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, come on. Like, are we really debating anti-Semitism and anti-Asian racism? Like, come on, it's fine. It's six books, five of which you guys have never fucking heard of. Let it go. <laughs> um, and so when that happens, like it's easy for journalists and other media personalities to just focus on the salacious aspects of fatness and to be disrespectful because there's no one in this world that's gonna stand up for fat people and be like, oh, leave them alone. It's simply not gonna happen. We're going to end as we began with a question from Michelle in our last two minutes. Given what you said about the importance of nuance in your writing and limitations of Twitter, why do you continue to tweet? What's the appeal? <laughs> Um, there's no appeal at all. <laughs> I, I, I think the appeal is nostalgia because it used to be a fun place for me. Um, I've been tweeting less simply because it's not fun anymore. It truly is not fun. And I'm, I'm just in denial about just how toxic it has become, but it truly has become almost an unusable platform. And that's a shame because it can't, when it's good, it's really, really good. But now there's this like, culture of intense policing that's happening like where people are like i'm i got the vaccine and then everyone's like why how when the goal is actually for every american to get vaccinated <laughs> so like however it happens sort of as long as you're not paying for the vaccine fucking go get the vaccine if you qualify who cares and so like it just becomes exhausting and it's hard to want to be open and to participate in a culture that is more invested in sort of attacking every single thing. It's just not fun. And I don't need everything to be fun, but this is not my job. Twitter is social media. And so I can socialize in other ways that are not going to make me hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> Roxanne Gay, what a pleasure to talk to you. We could go on for another 10 hours, but your people would never allow that. <laughs> so I great to see you. I would do 10 hours any day. Oh, oh, I love it. I'm going to send this right back to Sue uh, for her wrap up. Thank you, Roxanne. You're welcome. Thank you, Soledad. Oh. Do you need to unmute? There we go. Thank you, everybody, so much for Zoom and uh, technology. We are delighted you've been with us tonight. I thank Soledad and Roxanne. They rock. It was a wonderful conversation talk. And 92Y and Scribs have been so pleased to bring all of you tonight's event. Please remember to click on the link for a free 60-day trial. And don't miss Roxanne's essay on Scribd. Good night. Stay safe. <laughs>